Welcome to the Drawing Board by Tau Beta Pi, and today we'll be presenting the ideal gas law and the gas properties that are shown in there. So as you may already know, the ideal gas law is known as Pivnert, which is our greatest friend because it allows us to look at all these different gas properties. But you may ask, why are we looking at an ideal gas? And what even is an ideal gas? Well, the way I like to think of it is a bunch of ping pong balls. You've got all these ping pong balls and they're contained in a box. And for some reason, they're all bouncing around going in different directions. And when you're looking at all these ping pong balls, you can't determine which way they're going. They're going in random directions and they're also bouncing off of each other perfectly. So an ideal gas in a nutshell is all of these different gas particles, which you can think of as ping pong balls, that are acting in a ideal manner where the bouncing is perfect and the directions are randomized and stuff is a lot simpler. So back to Pivnert. So here we have five different terms. The first one is P for pressure. Next one is V for volume. We have N for moles. We have R, which is the gas constant. And we have T, which is temperature. So we know what each of these terms is in theory, but let's look at what each of these might look like. Another way of thinking of an ideal gas would be inside a big rubber balloon. So here we're gonna have all these different particles bouncing around and the number of particles is represented by the moles. So we have moles equal to the number of particles divided by Avogadro's constant, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So the other thing to think about is how fast all of these particles are going. So you have one going in this direction and then this direction, all of these going at all these speeds. So what is our speedometer for these particles? That's our temperature. Temperature is showing the speed of all these particles, which is a way of seeing how much energy is contained in this balloon. Now with all of these particles bouncing around, you have to think about all the force that is being exerted on the outside of the balloon. This is what pressure represents. So each time a particle hits the side, that's exerting a pressure outside of it. As that pressure is being exerted, we have a certain size that the balloon is expanded to. So that volume is how big the particles prop it up to be. So volume is not the actual size of the particles themselves, but it's the size that the particles are causing the balloon to be. Another way to think of it could be as the particles being the tent poles and the volume is the actual size of the tent itself. There's a lot of empty space. And lastly, we have R, our gas constant. So R is the glue that holds the ideal gas law together. All of these different properties are in different units. So the ideal gas law has to use the gas constant in order to join all of these together. So now that we've seen a little bit more about what these properties are, let's look at these units more closely. So pressure is usually gonna be in atmospheres or ATM. Some other units are Pascals, where one atmosphere is equal to 101,325 Pascals, or PA. Another unit is Tor, where one atmosphere equals 760 Tor, T-O-R-R. -R. This was named after the aggressively Italian name Evangelista Torricelli. Volume is usually gonna be in terms of L, which is liters. Another common unit might be a cubic meter, which is equal to a thousand liters. Moles, pretty self-explanatory. It's just in terms of the mole. Temperature is in the unit of Kelvin, which is a K. Now Kelvin is an absolute temperature, so at zero, there was no energy present. So in order to get Kelvin, we have to take degrees Celsius and add 273 and 0.15 if you're feeling ambitious. And lastly, we have R, which is again, the glue that holds this law together. So R is usually gonna be 0.08206, and that is in liters, atmospheres per mole Kelvin. So as long as we have the pressure, volume, moles, and temperature in those units, we can use that R constant and everything will be kept together. Another common one is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And joules is energy that is also equal to a meter cubed times a Pascal. So say we had meters cubed for our volume and Pascals for pressure, we could use that gas constant. 
So now that we know about Pivner, what is it good for? Well, let's look at a pretty simple problem. So here this is asking, what does the volume of one mole of an ideal gas at STP? So one thing we have to know is what is STP? STP stands for standard temperature and pressure. So for this example, we will use a temperature of zero degrees Celsius and a pressure of one atmosphere. That's one definition of standard temperature and pressure. So in order to apply Pivner, we can first write it out. So PV is equal to NRT. We want to find volume, so we can rewrite it as volume is equal to NRT divided by P. So now we can write in our values. We've got one mole times our gas constant, which is 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Then we have our temperature, which we have to put in Kelvin. So in order to do that, we can add 273. So at STP, it's just 273 Kelvin, which we'll write here. And then all of that divided by STP has a pressure of one atmosphere. So crunching all those numbers and putting it together, we'll end up with 22.41 liters. That is how much space our ideal gas takes up. So let's see how Pivner can apply to an actual reaction. So here we have three moles of hydrogen plus three moles of ethylene, and that's reacting to form three moles of ethane. So in this reactor, we're gonna be at five liters and 127 degrees Celsius. So the question is, if all of this reacts, what is the pressure of the vessel gonna be? So once again, we can throw down Pivner and rewrite it to see what pressure is, and we can drop in our values. So pressure is gonna be equal to three moles moles because that's the number that we're left with after the reaction. We have R, which is once again 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. We have temperature, which once again has to go in Kelvin. So we add 273 to our degree Celsius. And what do we know? We get 400 Kelvin, almost like we planned that. And all of that is on top of volume, which we're told is five liters. So once again, just crunching all those numbers, we end up with 19.69 atmospheres. So how about for changes in an existing process? So for instance, in this problem, we have five liters of oxygen at 25 degrees Celsius, and this is compressed down to just three liters. So the question is, what is the new temperature gonna be? If it's not at 25 degrees C, what is it gonna be? Now for this problem, we also have to know that pressure is kept constant, and the key for applying Pivner to these is writing the constant terms on one side of the equation, and then determining the later state using the other side. So let's start by writing down Pivnert. So we have PV is equal to NRT. And the things that are kept constant in this case are number of moles because it's a closed system, R because it is always a constant, and pressure. So let's rewrite it in terms of volume, which we'll keep on one side, temperature, which we'll have to divide. And then on the other side, we have NR over P. So once again, these are the terms that are changing and these are the terms that are constant. So once we've done that, and we know that one side is constant, we can call the current states V1 and T1, and the future states V2 and T2. And what do we know? We actually have what's called Charles' Law. So the ideal gas law can be used to show that Charles' Law, which says that the proportion between volume and temperature is gonna be linear, we can show that that is true. So in finding the value for this problem, we can just rewrite it, define our new temperature, T2, moving it over to the other side of the equation, it's going to be V2 divided by V1 over T1, which is the same thing as saying V2 over V1 times T1. So then again, plugging in those numbers, we get T2 is equal to our final temperature, which is th three liters over our current volume, five liters, and then multiplied by 25C, which we once again have to do in Kelvin. So adding 273 gets us to 298 Kelvin. So times times 298, and that leaves us with just 179 Kelvin as our final pressure after this compression. 
So here's an example where we have other things changing. So here we have a party balloon that currently contains one liter of helium and it's exerting a pressure of 1.1 atmospheres. The question is, if we change it so that it now is exerting 1.2 atmospheres, how many liters must be contained? And once again, we have to consider that temperature would remain constant for this. So once again, writing out Pivner, let's identify what is kept constant. So number of moles, R and T. So we've actually already gotten written out with what is changing changing on one side and what is constant on the other. So then we can rewrite that to find that P1 V1 is equal to P2 V2. And what do we know? We've got another law. This is called Boyle's law. So now we can go ahead and plug in our values once again. We'll rewrite it to find our new volume, which is V2. So to find that, we'll have to take the left-hand side with P1 and V1, divide that by P2, and then we can plug it all in. So we start off with 1.1 atmospheres. We end up with 1.2 atmospheres and we start off with one liter. So that leaves us with 0.92 liters. So that would be the amount that the balloon would hold if it exerted a higher pressure of 1.2 atmospheres. So we have one more example of changing these gas properties. So here we've got a 10 liter tank that can hold half of a mole of propane. So the question is how many moles can a larger tank of 25 liters hold? So for this problem, we have to be told that both pressure and temperature are held constant. So once again, put down Pivnert, identify what is constant. So we're told P and T, and we also know that R is constant. So we'll rewrite that to end up with V over N is equal to RT over P, these terms constant, and these terms changing, which gives us V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2. And here we have another law. This is Avogadro's law. So once again, we can rewrite it. We're looking for the new number of moles, which is N2. So we'll go ahead and take V2 and divide it by V1 over N1, which is the same as saying V2 over V1 times N1. So we started with 10 liters and we're going to 25 liters and we're starting with half a mole so that leaves us with 1.25 moles in the larger tank. So if we weren't looking at an ideal gas, which again is assuming that we have perfect bouncing of the ping pong balls that are these particles and that everything is randomly moving, then we have a real gas. Now real gas, we need to include two correction factors to account for these changes. So one is going to be A. So A corrects for attraction. So if we have particles that are at especially low temperatures, these particles will become attracted to one another and we won't have perfect bouncing of ping pong balls. The other correction factor will be B. This corrects for the volume of particles. This is usually gonna occur at very high pressures. So applying these correction factors, we have what is known as the van der Waals equation. So here we can see it's similar to Pivnert, but we have these two correction factors, A and B. So if we put these correction factors in, which will be different for every gas, then we can account for a more realistic situation. So a really quick example is looking at ammonia. So the question is, what is the temperature of one mole of ammonia gas if it's at one atmosphere, it's held in one liter, and we are going to use the van der Waals equation. So here we're given for ammonia that A is equal to 4.170. And once again, it's in our units of atmospheres, liters, and moles and we have B, which is 0 0.03707 liters per mole. So let's go back to writing out the van der Waals equation. So we have P plus A N squared, or V squared times V minus N B, that's equal to N R T. So we're looking for temperature, so we'll just divide everything on the left-hand side by N R. So we'll get T is equal to P plus A N squared over V squared times V minus N B, all divided by N R. Now we can plug in our values. So pressure, one atmosphere. We add in our A, 4.170. We can multiply that by the number of moles, just one mole. Divide that by our volume, is one liter, and square that. Then we can multiply that by our volume, which again is one liter. Subtract one mole times, squeezing it in, our 0 0.03707. And again, we have those in the correct units of liters and moles. Then divide all of that by one mole times our gas constant, 0.03707. 
8206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin in the same units. And plugging in all those values, we get a value of 60.67 Kelvin, which is very cold, but it is ammonia. So quick summary of what we've seen in this video. An ideal gas is essentially ping pong balls bouncing around perfectly in a box. We can look at the different gas properties as seen as in the balloon model, pressure, volume, the number of moles, and the temperature. And all of those are combined in the ideal gas law where R is the glue that keeps all of those units together. The ideal gas law can be used to determine properties from moles, which we're using in chemical reactions. You can use the ideal gas law to prove the three laws Laws, Charles Law, Boyle's Law, and Avogadro's Law. And if you're looking at real gases for a more realistic value, you need to use the correction factors A and B in the Van der Waals equation. Hopefully this video was helpful. This has been The Drawing Board by Taube Depay.